On this edition of Native Report, we visit Little Bighorn Battlefield National Monument in Montana. We meet artist Ben Pease and view his work of art that combine iconic celebrity images with Crow influences. And we learn about the historical importance of the buffalo for the Crow Nation in Montana. We also learn about what we can do to lead healthier lives and hear from our elders on this Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community the Blandon Foundation, and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation. Welcome to Native Report. I'm Ernie Stevens. And I'm Rita Aspinwall. Little Bighorn Battlefield National Monument in Montana memorializes one of the last armed efforts by the Northern Plains Indians to preserve their way of life. It is a beautiful place that harbors a history that still echoes in the present. The silence across these rolling hills is occasionally broken by the call of a meadowlark. This place is hollowed ground. This is Little Bighorn Battlefield. There's definitely something sacred about this area, simply because uh, the reason that these Indians, the Sioux and the Cheyenne were fighting was to preserve their way of life. And the reason the Crows were fighting was to preserve their way of life. Even though they were scouting against the Sioux and Cheyenne, um, all of the Indians had that in common, that they wanted to live how they wanted to live. And this was one of the last battles that the Indians won uh, defending that right. So there's something sacred about the land here and all the bloodshed, um, you have to respect this area because so many people gave their lives. It's a very spiritual place for a lot of people. Um, this place has a very strong emotional punch I've seen first time visitors and repeat visitors in tears. Whether they're sitting here uh, enjoying one of the ranger presentations, learning about what happened, maybe learning something different from what they heard in the Hollywood version or their school books and, and history classes. Um, but sometimes just standing up on Last End Hill or walking through the Indian Memorial, the sense of place and uh, it's very somber. There has been much written and many movies made about the Battle of the Little Bighorn, also known as Custer's Last Stand. For Luella, the history of this place is very real to her and her family. As we cross over this cattle guard, we're entering private land. So welcome to the Crow Indian Reservation. On the other side of where the interstate now stands, they see a pony herd of roughly 18,000 to 20,000 horses. Now, with that many ponies, they knew that there was a lot of warriors in this encampment. I'm the great, 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 great granddaughter of Gozahed, who was a scout, also half yellow face. I am the great, 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 great granddaughter of him. He, he was Gozahed's father-in-law. We have Gozahed's account of the battle in the book Pretty Shield, Pretty Shield Medicine Woman of the Crow. She was his wife, and so she gives his account and it's really interesting because it's different than some of the more common accounts that we look at. And uh, I tend to trust that one more because she got it directly from her husband. And some of these other accounts have been kind of passed down a little further. So, but it's really interesting to do all this research and find out, you know, this is what so-and-so said and this is what so-and-so said. And then when they match up, you're like, oh my God, this is the truth. So it's, it's fun looking at all of that. All through the battlefield, uh, including down here on Deep Ravine, uh, there are white soldier markers indicating where bodies were found. Uh, the Indian warriors, each of the tribes would have come in and removed the warrior bodies from the battlefield immediately after the battle occurred. 
the army attempted to do on-site burials, but the conditions were really difficult. And within a couple years of the battle, all the efforts had been made to remove all the bodies from the battlefield. The soldiers, the enlisted men are buried up on West End Hill in a mass grave. And the officers, for the most part, were removed right after the battle by their families and taken to maybe a family cemetery. In the case of Custer, he's at West Point. The park itself is 765 acres, and the battlefield is an estimated 11,000. On average, there are 300,000 visitors each year. What we encourage folks to do is stop at the visitor center and watch our really great orientation film. It's about a 25 minute video. And then we also have several different ranger talks that happen throughout the day right here on the patio. Um, it's a really important piece of American history and um, I hear our staff say every day, and if you're here later this afternoon, you'll hear me say it uh, when the Eric or Old Scout Society comes and tomorrow when we have Lakota and um, other folks here honoring their ancestors. For us to work here, it's a privilege every day to come here, to know that for the 5,000 servicemen, women, and family members that are buried in the cemetery, you know, this is their final resting place, as well as for those who fought here during the battle. And so it's, uh, in addition to being obviously a spectacularly beautiful place to be and to come to work. I was listening last night uh, at a meeting about the Sand Creek to a woman talk about the heaviness in her heart and um, all of the things that have been done over the years. And, uh, and yet in this place, for some people, there's an opportunity for peace and healing. And we really feel that with the Indian Memorial and our ability to tell a more balanced story now than might have been done initially in a pure army focus. It is a privilege and, um, and a real honor to be here and to be able to, to share the story of what happened here. It's important to remember what happened here at Little Bighorn uh, because it is the antithesis of that clash of cultures. We're still clashing, but this was the biggest clash. I mean, so many people died. Uh, so many Indians uh, survived, but it's because there were so many of them down there. Uh, they had a huge advantage in this battle, and hopefully, in the coming years, we can have that same advantage in uh, being recognized and being uh, allowing us to become more traditional and allowing us to become more successful in this other people's world. More than one in three American adults, 86 million in all, have prediabetes, and the vast majority of them don't even know it. Prediabetes is when your blood sugars are not normal but are not high enough to be called diabetes. There are no clear symptoms of prediabetes, and that's why many people don't know they have it. Prediabetes increases your risk of heart disease, stroke, and going on to have type 2 diabetes. In fact, 15 to 30 percent of people with prediabetes will go on to have diabetes within five years. Of course, having full-blown diabetes increases your risk for serious health complications, including blindness, kidney failure, heart disease, strokes, and loss of toes, feet, or legs. But having prediabetes does not guarantee you will develop diabetes, and the diagnosis does give you the chance to make lifestyle changes. Let me state that a little differently. Having prediabetes does not necessarily mean you will go on to develop diabetes if you make some changes. Exercise and weight loss are the cornerstones of prevention. Sometimes medicines are needed. Being more active can lower your blood pressure and cholesterol in addition to delaying or preventing diabetes. One of the best and easiest things to do is to start walking more. Ideally, we should be walking for 30 minutes a day, five days a week. Shorter walks also count and they can add up to 30 minutes if you can't do it all at once. There are lots of small things we can change that really make a big difference, like cutting back on regular soft drinks and juice and drinking more water or calorie-free drinks. Changing snacks from chips or candy bars to popcorn or fruit and eating more salads can have huge payoffs. Portion size is something most of us don't think about. Sharing the main course with a friend or family member or bringing half back home for lunch the next day is a great way to cut back on portions. Frying foods in butter, lard, or shortening adds lots of calories. Using a small amount of olive oil or skipping the frying pan altogether is a better choice. Grilling, steaming, baking, 
or roasting all use less fat than frying. We are living in a time when more and more people need to use the resources we have more wisely. Eating lots of meat and chicken uses more energy to produce than getting those proteins from plants like beans. This also cuts down on animal fats that make it hard to lose weight. Choosing fish twice a week is an option. If you can't cut out meats, using leaner cuts and chicken without the skin will help cut back on fats. Processed foods like bacon and sausage and hot dogs have become a part of the American diet and using these foods less often will cut back the risk of prediabetes turning into type 2 diabetes. Diabetes is a serious disease. Having a diagnosis of prediabetes is worrisome, but it can also be seen as an opportunity to make some changes for the better, changes that keep us around to become the elders we need to guide us forward. Speaking of elders, remember to call an elder. They've been waiting for your call. I'm Dr. Arnie Vinio, and this is Health Matters. Ben Pease is an up-and-coming artist from the Crow Nation in Montana. What makes his artwork stand out is his use of iconic celebrity images who are adorned in traditional crow clothing, giving the image a new meaning. In the shade of a tree near Custer Creek, Ben Pease unloads gear and several pieces of his artwork. On this morning, he'll paint what he calls a quick draw. So something just real fast and loose. I mean, it's not going to be perfect right now, but if I spend maybe 20 minutes or so, it'll look pretty realistic. You know, I don't try to, you know, focus in on the small details right away. I just kind of try to squint my eyes and see what looks correct and what doesn't look so correct. And so I'm just painting by instinct right now. And uh, it's nothing real scientific, but it comes out looking all right, to my eye anyways. Well, I've been doing art for, let's say, almost four years now, and uh, lately I've been working on, um, you know, chronicling the, the Native American, uh, how would I say, the Native American um, journey, you know, in contemporary society, in mainstream society, I mean, European society, so. Um, so I've been trying to uh, depict them in a more societal state. For example, I did a, a recent piece, I called it uh, Ultimate Warriors, and I depicted four uh, traditional, from, it was a, a traditional photograph from the 18, 1890s maybe, and it was of four traditional crow foot racers, and they had a breech cloth, and uh, they were barefoot. They didn't have any moccasins on, so it must have been a short, shorter race. And so I've, I've taken that image and I've appropriated it into um, adding Nikes on their feet, Nike uh, running shoes. I've kind of mixed the, uh, the, the old with the new in this one, uh, juxtaposition. Ben works with acrylics, oils, and charcoal on a variety of papers in addition to traditional canvases. He also does mixed media collages. All of his artwork honors his Crow and Cheyenne ancestry. You know, I think it brings a lot of different um, subtleties into my work. So say the, the ledger papers from 1908 and some particular event happened in 1908 and so I, can, can, I could uh, contextually con connect that with the art I'm doing or portraying. And then the paints, you know, acrylics or oils, you know, people are kind of on the fence about those, but you know, I like to work with them in different ways, you know, because they bring their own strengths in certain parts. And then graphites, you know, the darks, the lights, um, pen, you know, the straight darks, lines, and things like that. And so I'm always trying something new. Basically, it's all experimentation, you know. I'll be walking down the street and I'll see, you know, like a feather, you know, on a window and like a stereotypical Native American man wearing a headdress. And maybe that will inspire me to do a more uh, socio-political piece. Or I'll see, like walking through the halls of the tribal building here in Crow Agency, I'll see um, at one of our uh, tribal elders, and I'll, I'll have some motivation, de determination to depict that person. And, uh, or like in the mainstream news, I'll see some issues happening there, or I'll notice some issues on the reservation, and I'll, I'll go after those. Some of Ben's most striking works are contemporary iconic images that contain Crow and Cheyenne cultural influences. John Lennon sports white weasel ermine skins 
and Audrey Hepburn's black cocktail dress is adorned with traditional cowrie shells. So John Lennon here, he's part of the series Words Are Your Weapons, as is Audrey Hepburn over here if you got that shot. Um, people who I've depicted in the series Words Are Your Weapons are people who were, you know, better people than society made them out to be, you know. A lot of people called John Lennon a rebel, but there's times where he stood up for Native Americans when nobody else would. You know, I think one of, one of his quotes, he was on a nightly show and he said, uh, and he was speaking of natives and their land and their cultures and their traditions. If you don't let them practice this, um, either either give it to them or die, I guess, is basically what he said. When he was around, he, you know, he he was a good man, you know, he, he stood for a lot more. So um, this is a mixed media piece, as you can tell. This is on canvas um, background. It's a, it's a bunch of different layering. So it's background acrylic, um, the actual um, records here. And the, um, it's from a vintage poster, is the image of John Lennon here, and I think his t-shirt said New York. Um, and I've, I've kind of appropriated Native American uh, regalias with the uh, white weasel ermine skins here. Each one of these denotes a war deed in the Crow way, you know, steal, stealing an enemy's horse, striking an enemy to count coup, um, to lead a successful war party into battle and back, and uh, to um, steal an enemy's weapon. And also I've added the um, Indian power um, buttons here along with the American Indian movement um, patch. Just kind of immortalizing John Lennon for, for his deeds. Audrey Hepburn. Most people uh, throughout time have known her for just being, you know, a beautiful person. You know, one of the most beautiful celebrities. Well, I know her as, you know, being a uh, really positive role model and figure in the humanitarian societies. She's always helped people in need. I've kind of leaned more towards um, my art being more educational for the people and for its viewers, fighting against stereotypical terms or you know racial slurs. Try to hold on to the culture also through my artwork. As an American Indian songwriter, a Native American songwriter, as an American songwriter, I would say you lead people gently to a brutal truth, especially in our histories. And so you can't be an angry Indian and suffer from historical trauma so much that you write just angry songs, but you can't be a Disneyland Indian that you're so numb to our history. And so you kind of got to develop a code, a metaphoric code, you know, using metaphors and kind of camouflage um, protest. You know, I call it a modern protest. And people like Floyd Westerman would talk about the modern protest and, you know, the way that both of us would play music. And his style, he would say, um, my style would be kick him in the shins, you know, with the truth, you know, like that old style of folk. But he goes, I like this new style that you're playing. Um, you're making people follow you you know, like a Pied Piper kind of thing. You play a song and then let everybody play their own song. And, and, and that's where that communication kind of comes into where I really like it being a musician. And you learn all these things to play on your chords, you play, and it's almost like you're not in the studio. You know, I can see different things where I can paint my masterpiece of audio sound in the studio but tonight I'm going to paint an audio sound of live music and let it unfold. Buffalo roamed the Bighorn Mountains like they did generations ago, near Crow Agency, Montana. And the animal is still an important resource for the Crow Nation. The herd is closely managed by the nation's Fish and Game Division to ensure the resource is there for future generations. The sun is at its midday peak and this small herd of buffalo, also known as the American bison, grazes in the pasture. The Crow Nation Fish and Game Department rounded up this group from a larger herd in the Bighorn Mountains. The ones behind us, uh, these we took these down uh, last September from the herd in the mountain and the intent is to um, sell them and process the meat and kind of generate revenue off of 
uh, the meat is kind of a little bit higher than beef around here. We got about 2,000 head up in the Bighorn Mountains. Uh, tribal members can hunt them for free. Uh, they use it for feeds, for cultural reasons. Uh, maybe they need a robe for some. Uh, there's different various aspects in our culture you can use them for. And uh, we also sell hunts. Um, we sell about maybe 20 to 30 hunts a year to generate revenue for the fish and game. Uh, and we actually uh, promote that. It's actually a pretty good deal. So we, we maintain the herd, we guide them, and then we, we also enforce the game codes on the reservation. So. We got about 20 guys on staff. Uh, we cover 2.2 million acres, uh, the entire reservation. We got to be out there every day, year round. Uh, we got people hunting. There's, there's no seasons for the crows. At one time, the bison numbered in the millions across the plains and were hunted nearly to extinction. Today, even though herd numbers are smaller, the significance of the bison to the Absaluki, or the Crow Nation, is as great as it was hundreds or even thousands of years ago. At one point, uh, it was kind of meant everything to the crow. I mean, we got all our clothing and uh, teepees and food and uh, followed the herds uh, with the horses and uh, they kind of meant everything. And uh, a lot of tribes were the same way, but uh, in the modern era, I guess, uh, they've lost touch with the buffalo, the bison, and uh, we still kind of have a, a good grip with, uh, with the bison. Back in the day, they, you know, if they were in the hundreds of millions. If we sat here and we we're on a herd right now, it, was, it would probably stretch uh, as, as far as you can see. And they would just, when they roll through, they just plow up the ground and they just leave a big old path. And it's just, I mean, I, I can't even imagine that, the, what the way to describe how many buffalo there was on the plains back in the day. I learned about the buffalo maybe as a kid. My uncles used to, used to go and take one every year and they'd bring me along and we'd, you know, we'd go on the hunt. And we just kind of, I guess, took it for granted that it was kind of a normal thing. You don't realize until you start growing up that not everyone gets to uh, experience what we experience here. And again, it kind of makes you proud to be part of the Crow tribe. There's a connection, not only with, with myself, I see it with tribal members. Uh, they don't usually come out and hunt it a lot, but when they do, they kind of feel a connection and they kind of a sense of pride that we can still do do what we did you know 100 years ago and still keep our ways and the crow nation game and fish department do harvest the bison for ceremonial purposes the department also oversees other game management practices ensuring the natural resources such as the bison are there for future generations last week uh, they wanted uh, two buffalo taken for a feed uh, and they wanted it done with a bow uh, because if we used a rifle, they would just break through the fence. And it's a little little different here on the mountain. You got timber and brush and, and stuff to take cover and sneak up on them, but we kind of had to, um, they seen us coming. So it was kind of a standoff and it was really stressful. And uh, we had someone with a bow and we had two backup shooters just in case. And they were pretty angry. That's, I mean, they're as wild as can be. You can't approach them, they'll charge you. It's pretty dangerous. We also do enforcement, uh, obviously. We gotta enforce the game code. People like to violate the law, they like to take shortcuts. And we also have a little focus on conservation. Uh, this year we just started a huge conservation effort. We're mapping all the sage grouse. I guess they're trying to uh, put them on the endangered species list. So we're trying to locate all the, the breeding sites and nesting grounds. We documented that and we also uh, were actually starting another program with the black-footed ferret uh, and they, uh, they live off prairie dogs and they're pretty much uh, wiped out around here. It's pretty much extinct in the wild. So uh, in September, I think we're going to get 30. And we got a place uh, a little west of here where we're going to introduce them and try to maintain them and hopefully they uh, take a foothold and come back. So. Sometimes I'm stuck in the office and it's, uh, it gets a little boring, but just being in the mountains, uh, 
especially the big horns, there's like a certain smell like in July, like the, the green and the, the plants and stuff up there. You kind of, when it's a long winter, you, you miss that stuff. And I just like being outdoors. I like to take my kids along and show them, you know, what they showed me and stuff. You know, pass it along and keep it alive. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us on the web at nativereport.org, on Facebook, and on Twitter. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors in Indian Country. I'm Rita Aspinwall. And I'm Ernie Stevens. We'll see you next time on Native Report. Rita Aspinwall is an enrolled member of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa and is an ICWA social worker with Fond du Lac Social Services. Ernie Stevens is a member of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and is a film and television producer. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community, the Blandon Foundation, and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation. <laughs>